So it's the Luke and Leo show once again, this time Intel Broadwell. Uh, Broadwell is fifth generation Core i3, Core i5, Core i7. I don't think they're bringing any other cores into the equation, so we're not going to have to worry about Core i4, 6 or whatever else. Uh, so we don't. No, well, yes, yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, so Broadwell, if we talk, think of it in terms of fifth gen, uh, first things first is, well, when was Broadwell actually due? Last year, which was 2014. Yeah, yeah, yes, it's, it's quite heavily laid now, shall we say? Yes. Mm. And in addition, the thing of separating or segmenting Broadwell into at least four segments. So Broadwell Y is for tablets, um, and then we've got the low end. Uh, we've got the mini PC uh, version. We've got uh, high end laptop, yeah. and then we've got desktop. Now we have apparently seen well. Broadwell Y is apparently out there. I personally have not seen Broadwell Y. I've been talked at about it. Um, have you seen Broadwell Y for tablets? Don't recall seeing it, no. no. no I've not. seen Broadwell Y for uh, mini PCs, the like, likes of Gigabyte Bricks S, which was very good. Uh, and in a sense, it was, it was just an incremental improvement on the uh, fourth gen. I liked it, lower power, slightly better performance, better graphics, and what's not to like. Uh, what I'm waiting for, however, is the high-end stuff. I want to see a high-end laptop, multi-core, maximum speed, loads of the battery, and then desktop. Where are we at, Luke? Well, we're still waiting for the desktop, unfortunately. Um, we've got some news in the past week, obviously, that there could now be two SKUs rather than the big arsenal that usually comes with a new series launch. So this is probably going to be the i5, the unlocked version, and the i7, the unlocked mm. version. Um, Quite frankly, I'm not sure I see this as such a big problem, personally. Um, I think Broadwell is quite late now, we all know that, and we know Skylake is just around the corner, which will mm. be the TOX, so the more important than the, um, the more important performance upgrade, micro-architecture micro enhancement than the TIP, which is the process shrink, which is what Broadwell is. So I think cutting it down to two SKUs may make sense. You still get some of the experience with 14 nanometer. You can take that out to Skylake. Um, now, do you think, if, if we have one Core i5 and one Core i7, of course it's possible they'd bring out more models eight. Let, let's go with there'll be one Core i5, one Core i7, which means no Core i3, mm -hmm. um, and then they're moving on to Skylake, which is tip, would traditionally be around sort of September, October, that think? proverbial fall Christmas thing, yeah. um, in which case they basically would get their skates on because it's uh, just about to be April. Uh, so they've got very few months to bring this out. Uh, you've got the business of, uh, is that face saving? Is that because the partners have got the motherboards and waiting months? Is that just to show they can? Would it be too embarrassing to can it all together? I think it's a combination of all of those, to be honest. I personally don't think canning it would be a good idea because I think even though that it's late, um, getting this tick so the process shrink will give us some knowledge with 14 nanometer. Intel will be able to see how it reacts. I'm guessing they already know from their own work internally. But seeing how that reacts on the enthusiast platforms out in the wider market, I think that experience will be important. We've seen in the past with Haswell. When Haswell came out, it was a complete nightmare to cool. <laughs> the, heat, the heat output, it was, it, was, it was very much a problem. Everybody, well, seemed to have an opinion on it. It was very difficult to cool. The overclocking wasn't all there. So we saw that everybody, they did complain, let's say it as it is. Some mm. people complained and Intel fixed that with Devil's Canyon. Devil's Canyon is a much better... Um, should we say out of the Haswell micro architecture? Mm. So I do think it is still important to bring it to market just so we can get the experience. Will it be something that enthusiasts will be interested in? Well, possibly because it lengthens the life of the LGA 1150 platform. So mm. you can still run on your Z97 motherboard that you currently have. You might be upgrading from a lower power chip. So I, I think it still is important, but perhaps not as important as if it came out a few months ago. And then if we fast forward six months to uh September and let's say Skylake has arrived as we're hoping it will and uh, given the, the current thing where you've got the, the, the chip segmented into these four markets let's say Skylake arrives and you've got the entire tranche of everything across the piece including desktop so that's quite a huge bit of speculation uh, that being the case where do we then sit in terms of chipsets at the enthusiastic forget the sort of mid-range and lower end how many platforms and sockets and chipsets do we then have on the market in the Intel side of things well, we're going to have, obviously, there's going to be quite a few in the transition periods, but Skylake, the rumours suggest that it's going to come along, it's going to bring the whole new chipset with us, so the Z107, the 10 series chipset, the new socket, so they're not going to be backwards compatible with your current um, your 1150C, Z87, Z97 motherboards. 
Haswell E on the Enthusiast platform, so LG 1120-3 and the X99 chipset, that will still be there. But as we've seen Intel do in the past, the mainstream or the mid-range, we said the mid-range mainstream platform, mm. will be flying the flag forward in regards to architecture and then the Enthusiast platform will follow. So the, the, the main Enthusiast platforms that we'll be interested in come the end of the year are likely to be the Skylight chipsets, probably Z107 and still X99 mm. that will still be relevant for quite a long time to come. We've seen X79 is still relevant these days, not only up I have recently. just built an X79 PC myself, which I'm about to start using for video editing as it happens, so that there we have it. Um, on the Enthusiast end, I think it's LJ2011, isn't it? I think it's at 1120. Is it? And they'll, oh, yeah, they'll, okay. be, they'll be listening. They'll, they'll be listening. They will. They do. 2011 is yes. three. That's what I'm Indeed, okay. indeed. Uh, now, which generation on the 2011, what 2011, which generation of uh, are we currently on with that? Because they always run in arrears, don't they? Yeah, well, we're at the interesting point now, actually, where we synchronize between uh, the mainstream chipset, so LG1150 and LG2011-3. Mm -hmm. They synchronize. They both have well microarchitecture. Mm -hmm. So you've got your Devil's Canyon chips, um, all the, the standard Haswell chips running in the mainstream platforms. Mm -hmm. And then you get your Haswell E processors running the high-end platforms. And I think, I remember when I reviewed this back um, the term of September, I think this was, this was an interesting point in the market because it was one of the few times in recent memory that actually everything is synchronized, so you're still getting your best core performance on your high-end platform. So you're not just getting more cores, but from an older architecture, you are getting your best cores. Except, right? that's important. The, interestingly, of course, we were supposed at that stage on the desktop to move on to the next even with that thing with the enthusiast would have been a generation by a, a step behind yeah so, more grump but older and yet as you say kind of this delay has kept it all in sync yeah so it's almost kind of widened the gap between mainstream and uh, the enthusiast platforms mm. perhaps in some respect whereas previously you'd have to decide do you want the newest chips on the mainstream platform or are you happy to go with the higher powered more core older chips mm. and quad channel memory and other things on the enthusiast platform and of course, with the enthusiast side of things, the, the one thing you care least about is cooling, provided it's not totally insane. You, provided you're cooling yes. properly, you, you're plugging in, whereas on the mobile side of things, clearly, if you can bump up your battery life for 20 minutes or save the old watt here or there, it uh, cool. makes a huge difference. Um, LJ2011, an extra 50 watts, it's all right, you can crank up the cooling. Just need more. a better cooler. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> oh, goodness me, Lee. Um, on that subject, and to, going completely sideways, um, do you still use air coolers or is it liquid across the piece for you? Well, as far as performance goes, I think liquid is there now. I think the likes of Corsair is H100i, we've seen the 105, so the dual 120, dual 140 radiators and fans, they are the real deal as mm. far as simple cooling goes. Obviously, we can go to full custom water cooling, which will oh, that's reap right. better yes. rewards. Yes, 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 yes. It, it's, it's a challenging it. procedure. It's, it's something that yeah. I'd be excited to experiment <laughs> with soon, but it's a challenging procedure. But I think air cooling still has its part in the market as far as um, perhaps lower maintenance. You can argue that point. Um, you could also argue against that point, I guess. But uh, you've got different fin arrays, so you can go with lower speed fans, so typically quieter. Mm. Um, perhaps, perhaps less modes of failure. So I know some people have mentioned they're scared of the pumps failing or the pipes leaking and other things like well, that. Well, the pipes leaking, I mean, I, I did Gigabyte Water Force just recently, so my uh, on Extreme Edition, um, and that was the latest Extreme Edition, um, lent me by Luke. Uh, where that was running with a Corsair liquid cooler on it, and then the three gigabyte uh, Waterforce graphics cards, each with their own individual. So it's the first time in my life I've had four pumps and radiators and, and a whole uh, snake of uh, liquid cooling going on. Uh, and it worked flawlessly. But even there, at least one of the reader comments was, what if we get a leak? And it's like, well, if you're not going to build it yourself, if it's been done by a bloke in a factory and knows what he's doing, that's the one thing I didn't expect. Pump failure, yeah, possibly. Me putting the thing on incorrectly. Definitely possible, anything is possible. But actually, a coolant leak, that, that didn't. Whereas if you're building your own loop, that would be right up there on the list of yeah. failures. I think there's still the, should we say, the negativity around potentially well, having a liquid inside <laughs> your PC. I think there's still this, this scare factor, yes. perhaps, and perhaps understandably so. Um, some of the earlier iterations are going back all the way to the Corsair H50. Um, some people suggested around about that era, so I know some of the coolant models were a bit... Uh, more prone to leakage and mm. mechanical problems, but I think with the new tubing materials we've seen the flexi tubing rather than the plastic type oh, yes. uh, tubing that you've mm. seen recently, I think they have really helped the durability of these uh, all-in-one coolers. But I think it's an interesting point there, 
is are we going to see a bigger transition to liquid cooling in graphics cards? So mm -hmm. up until now it's been yes. largely um, an air cooled heat sink, so dual fan, single fan reference. Um, and then if you really want to push the clocks, push the voltage, uh, tame the beast, shall we say, you go for custom water cooling. But we've seen more and more since the 295X2 and some models yes. like the whole core settings, what, the HG10. What, mm. but, but with, with the um with the factory cards that come liquid cooled, it's always struck me as being not, not exactly a sign of desperation, but it's that sort of mark of, oh, right, they, they've had to do this because otherwise it could all go horribly, horribly wrong. I think that's Whereas point, those, yeah. those adapter brackets, as you say, of course, the problem with those is they're specific to a certain family of graphics cards. I mean, I've got one coming from Corsair hopefully soon, which is going to be for a particular range of uh, GPUs, but it's not an NVIDIA bracket or an AMD bracket, it's for some NVIDIA. Um, yeah. And then even there, they then have to put into the thing of, oh, and do check the manufacturers, yeah. follow the, the reference spec, because if the heights of things are wrong, I mean, that's potentially Yeah, I know the, the NZXT version, which came out a few months ago, perhaps a year ago, that was quite a good version, it had a good range of uh, support, but there were still some issues, like, for example, the R9 290X, some of the models you needed spacers, for example. Yes, so. well, this is, and that's the thing, I mean, and as we know, it's one thing if you put the thing on the lines all up, and then you're actually checking, is it high, is it clamped down correctly? Yeah. How do you know, yeah. oh dear, what happened there? But I think from the cooling front, that's something I'd like to see more of, is uh, liquid cooling and graphics cards. Just so we can push those clocks, we can take the heat elsewhere rather than just dumping it inside your system. Yes, yes, quite. Excellent, right, so that's uh, what we've done there. We've done Broadwell, and we've done our views on cooling, and we're right on cooling, obviously. Um, and with you said Broadwell, it, not me. <laughs> And with Broadwell, we're not quite sure what's going on, but frankly, there's something's going to happen before the end of the year, and then realistically, Skylake's going to overtake it, and then that means that the enthusiast stuff is what two generations behind suddenly, potentially, potentially, potentially. 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 I have no idea on that front, potentially. <laughs>